In the second part of the lecture, we want to dive into more details of real, the realization of runtime variability. So how can we realize runtime variability at source code? So we'll focus on source code for now, but there will also be later lectures uh, where we look into other artifacts. So the question is, now that we have the vision of runtime variability, which can be configured by means of different techniques, we talked about runtime parameters, about uh, configuration options in terms of configuration files or preference dialogues, the question is, how can this be realized in the source code that the program actually behaves different? So again, this is related to binding time. So in the first part of the video, we talked already about binding times. So the variability offers us choices and the derivation of a product requires to make decisions at a certain point in time. And decisions may be bound at different binding times. And the question is, um, when does it happen? By whom? So we looked at different techniques already in the first part of the lecture. And the question is, how is this realized then in source code? So we already introduced the a uh, graph library, uh, library example from the user perspective, from the perspective of applications in the last part of the video uh, of the lecture. And in this video, I'm going to show you some source code and we will use the source code throughout this whole lecture part to visualize runtime variability. So, but first let's uh, consider the case of a non-variable implementation of graphs, meaning this is kind of what you can expect from undergraduate courses or something like this, where you have a simple graph implementation that fulfills certain requirements, but maybe not all the different possible combinations that we envisioned uh, in the previous part. So we might have a graph and the graph consists of node, nodes and edges. Uh, so we have a list of, uh, uh, of those and we might have certain uh, operations on a graph. We can add um, an edge between two nodes, N and M, uh, but we can also add an edge uh, and also in addition specify a certain weight for that edge. And we might be able to print out uh, the whole graph on command line or by means of uh, a graphical user interface. So this graph already uh, uses, makes use of several other classes that we also want to show. Uh, for instance, we have nodes and those nodes have a certain ID. They have a certain color uh, to be able to express the coloring of nodes. And when we print out those nodes, we might need to set the display color when printing out those nodes, uh, either on, on a graphical user interface or on command line, we would need to set the color uh, of before printing out the node. And then we have edges and for edges, uh, an edge connects to nodes. So we need to specify the nodes that it connects. We uh, might have a weight for the edge and we have a constructor that uh, initializes the uh, nodes that are connected and a print method that basically prints out one node, prints out the other node and then prints out the weight that is assigned to this edge. And for the weight, uh, it could be just an integer, but for the purpose of this example, we have a separate class for this over here, uh, which we can also use to print out the weight of an edge. So while this is a graph implementation that you could use or imagine to be used somewhere in the source code, in practice, we would typically have way larger implementations of the graph. And you also see some dots in here that we exclude some parts for brevity, um, but this is still one single product. So this is when you think of the first lecture, uh, this is single system engineering. This is one particular implementation. And it's hard to actually see the features, but we can show you the features. So the features are somewhere in the source code and we need to look into this carefully to identify those features. So the, for the purpose of this lecture, we highlighted those features for you in a different color, but the typical way of developing, you will not have different colors for features in your source code. So it will be harder to recognize them. So a feature could be the feature weight, for instance, which, is, uh, which has the red color, uh, is, uh, uh, can be found in a particular statement, like over here, you see, 
can visualize this. So it could be just a single statement that is um, uh, connected to the uh, feature, or it could be a complete method because if we don't have weights at all, why we, uh, there's no need to call this method at all because then we could always um, um, yeah, uh, call the other method edge. But we've also had other classes and uh, let's visualize the feature color with another color and the color is blue over here. So what we can see here is that we have um, uh, the class node and we have uh, the field color and the field color is actually only needed if nodes are colored. If we don't want to specify a color for a node, then we don't need this field. And we have uh, a certain statement over here, which is only needed. And we even have a particular class, a whole class that is only needed if a certain uh, feature is available. And there's nothing new on the uh, remaining part over here. So for the class edge, uh, of course, we have something similar. So the weight is only needed if we can have weights at all for edges. We have a certain statement here, which is uh, not needed if we don't have weights. And we have, again, a particular class being uh, yeah, only needed if we have weights, weighted edges at all. So what we, why we have written symbolic feature traces on top of the slide is that in a typical implementation, in a single implementation, you typically don't have these, some, uh, these feature traces, right? So we just made up these feature traces for you to visualize where are those features in a source code. And it's actually hard to identify features in a larger code base. And we call them symbolic as we only uh, colored them here for the purpose of this lecture. So the basic idea how we can realize runtime variability is very simple. So we have conditional statements. So conditional statements on this slide are shown over here, for instance, or over here. And these conditional statements, they control which, uh, which behavior is to be expected from that very program. So if we don't have weighted edges, then we don't need to uh, initialize the, uh, the weight for edges. So this means we assume that there is some variable. However, this is defined. We will see on the next slides. But the basic principle of runtime variability, of adding variability or to our implementation, is that we have variables and they control uh, conditional statements. So it's a bit more complicated when it comes to methods because we Java doesn't allow us to wrap a whole method uh, by means of a conditional statement. So what we can do, the only thing we can do here is to say, we throw a one-time exception if the method is called, even though it's actually not allowed, right? So if we don't have weights, then it wouldn't make sense to call this method. And we have other examples here. So uh, we see that uh, we have the feature colored, uh, uh, and it's a very similar uh, uh, procedure over here. But we already see that there are parts that are not so, that do not so really align with the principle. So you see over here that the field color and the field weight, they're always there. They're simply not used and not initialized if a certain feature is not chosen. So now we want to take a look uh, more closely how those variables can be defined, right? So the basic principles using conditional statements, but where to define those variables. And there are uh, two major strategies how to do this. And one is using global variables. What does it mean? In the program, and this depends a bit on the programming language, we define global variables, which can be accessed from every part of the program. So for instance, in our case, we could create a public class. So it's important that this class is public because we want to access this from everywhere. Um, and we have static, public static fields. And those public static fields give us um, the variables that we want to access from everywhere in the source code. And we already see how they are configured. So for instance, colored is um, 
to be defined as selected and wages is uh, defined as not selected over here. So we see what changed in the previous example is how we access this variable weighted. It's config.weighted uh, and over here it's also config.weighted. So we can access configuration and as it is static, uh, we don't need to deal with a configuration object, for instance, uh, but we can directly access the uh, public static variables from this class. So this can also be applied, of course, to the classes node and edge and uh, at every position where we uh, use the variables uh, colored and weighted we simply replace them by config.weighted and config.colored. There's a special case um, of global variables um, and this is that we can have immutable variables. So the difference in the example is that we made those two uh, options, those two configuration options, those two variables, constants opposed to being variables. So what this means is that whenever we compile the program, the compiler already knows that this is the configuration of the variables and the compiler already knows the configuration at compile time. So the compiler can actually make use of this information and uh, apply certain optimizations to remove dead code. So for instance, in this example, this would be dead code. And if uh, yeah, the, this part of the code is dead, then even this uh, conditional statement does not make sense anymore and this all can be removed. On the other hand, we see that the code over here is actually dead code because uh, we were always uh, throw a one-time uh, exception and it could be that even this part of the program is optimized away so that we have a smaller implementation of the program. Of course this is only feasible as the compiler already knows this configuration, the values true and false, and these are final variables, uh, final values con uh, uh, constants, so there can be constant propagation, constant folding, and so on, all the uh, optimizations that we know from compiler construction. The disadvantage, of course, in this case of immutable global variables in general is that there's no possible external configuration by the end user. Right? So we looked at different strategies to configure our runtime variability by means of command line parameters, uh, by means of preference dialog, by means of configuration files. And all those three strategies are not applicable here if we have immutable global variables. The reason is that already at compile time, this selection is chosen. So this is in, uh, in uh, some sense not a real technique for runtime variability, but could be even considered compile time uh, variability already. So another option uh, in contrast to global variables is to use method parameters. So how does it work? The idea is that a class exposes its configuration parameters as part of its interface. So for instance, um, uh, we have the class graph and the graph needs to know whether it has weighted edges and whether the nodes are colored. So these are two properties whenever we instantiate a new graph, we specify these two parameters. Uh, so we see this over here. So we have a constructor now, which takes those two arguments and saves them for later use. And then we see that these parameters are used later on uh, in the implementation. But we also see that other parts of the program, uh, for other parts of the program, we need to pass certain parameters. And we see this over here. So we need to pass to the class edge whether it's weighted or not. And we can see here that the class, um, uh, the constructor actually gets this additional information. And that's why the graph actually needs to know whether it's weighted, not only to uh, have some source code that is conditionally uh, executed or not executed, but also to pass it forward to other parts of the program which rely on this parameter. Again, we see that this is stored. Uh, we have some additional field over here that stores the value and 
uh, whenever we <coughs> access this variable, then uh, we can have the behavior that we uh, intended to have when the feature is selected. So method parameters uh, and to pass kind of pass along those parameters, uh, uh, pass along those parameter values with method invocations has the advantage that we can even look at different instantiations in the same program, right? So you could imagine this is, uh, that there's an application where we want to have directed and undirected edges. One example could be that pedestrians can walk uh, a sidewalk in both directions, but a car or a bicycle can only drive in certain directions. So it might be that we look at the example of navigation, that we even want to have different combinations of the graphs in the same, in the very same program. So the advantage here is that we can have different instantiation even in the same program at runtime in memory, we can have different kinds of graphs. The disadvantage is that it may lead to methods with many parameters, right? And this is actually known as a code smell uh, if we have long parameters lists. Uh, I think that's the name of the code smell. And uh, over here, uh, there are, of course, ways how to cope with this, but this would be then somehow. Uh, uh, a mixture between method parameters and a configuration object. Of course, we could always pass a configuration object, which is then very close to global variables. Or we could think of different configuration option, uh, objects, for instance, one to configure edges and one to configure uh, nodes, uh, which would be then more detailed depending on the use case to avoid these long parameter lists. But in any case, uh, we will have some additional effort to pass over these um, these uh, configuration objects uh, or these uh, parameters. And in any case, this gives some additional effort for at runtime. So now the question comes, if we take global variables or if we take parameters and we do not look at the special case of immutable global variables, but all, all the other cases, then the question is, what about reconfiguration at runtime? Right? So we could start the program with the values false for weighted and colored over here. Uh, and at some point in time during program execution, we could say, we changed this configuration. We want another program now, right? So I, I started as a uh, uh, riding my bike, but at some point in time, I got a flat tire, so I put the, uh, the bicycle on hold and uh, I will walk the rest. So I want to have this one-time configuration. So you could think ab uh, about this example, whether you see some problems with this example um, uh, for a minute. So we've had some time to look at the example. And the problem uh, with this example is that what could happen is that over here, if we still have the value false over here, we will simply not execute this line. And if someone during execution, we change this value, and it will be true at this time, then we will execute this line and pass a null value over here, which could result in a null pointer exception. So it might happen that altering that feature selection without stopping uh, and restarting the program actually leads to um, unwanted behavior at runtime because we might have some inconsistent state uh, after the reconfiguration. So this means that the feature-specific code, the code that is dependent on certain values of options, it, it is typically initialized when we would start the program up front with a certain configuration. And we assume it to be invariant uh, in, in many cases. And just updating the values true and false of our configuration options, of our feature variables, is not enough 
and it, we typically need to update the current state of the program. And this is a very frequent source of bugs uh, that uh, will be uh, kind of hidden somewhere. Uh, and uh, this will be also uh, bugs that are hard to find uh, for developers. So there are other problems with runtime configuration, despite that we need to look at, uh, need to be careful with reconfiguration. And one of the other examples is that of code scattering. So when we look at the, the graph implementation, uh, now with runtime variability, we have config.weighted. So we've used uh, global variables in this example, but it doesn't really matter which technique we use over here. What we see is that a certain feature like weight is actually scattered all over the place, right? So we see six different parts. It's actually quite nice that we have a class that is completely devoted to that feature, but we have very detailed um, uh, yeah, variability somewhere uh, spread all over the place. So why is this a problem? When you think of feature traceability, you want to identify a feature somewhere in the source code and you have a bug, uh, associated with a certain feature, then you want to identify all the source code locations. And if we have a larger implementation than this one that fits on the, onto the slide, then this is typically a very time consuming task to identify all the different spots all over the implementation and to identify this, those parts that are relevant to the bug or the maintenance task or the uh, further evolution of features. Code scattering is actually, um, uh, very connected to another problem that is called tangling. So the problem with code tangling is that we have certain uh, feature codes, certain options that are realized, but they are tangled to each other, right? So in this example, we see that we have two features being implemented in the class edge, the base implementation and the feature uh, weighted. And we see that those are somehow intermixed with each other. In this small example, it's hard to see why this is a problem uh, because we only have like uh, two, the base implementation and one for the feature. But in practice, we have cases where you have 10 or 20 uh, different features on a single page of the screen. And some might even be outside of the screen, so uh, to, not easy to recognize. Uh, the scattering, so uh, recognizing different places where the feature is located, but also maintaining a single constructor over here, the edge uh, constructor, will be hard because um, we actually need to deal with all the features that are implemented in this constructor. And then we have the third and last problem that we will talk about uh, today, and this is the problem of code replication. So it's a bit uh, it was a bit uh, problematic to find a good example in this small uh, use case over here, but we see that there's actually two uh, statements that are completely identical uh, in, in those two cases. So we have an in uh, initialization uh, of the uh, weights uh, on different uh, places in the implementation. And this is considered code replication. And the question is, can we avoid this somehow? Yeah, and we will see that some of the later implementation techniques that we will discuss in this course will try to avoid those code replication or also known as code clones. So code replication does not only mean, need to mean that we have identical copies of the source code, but also very similar copies and replicates of the source code. And we will talk about this problems with code clones in more detail in the third lecture. In this part of the lecture, we talked about different strategies, how to realize runtime variability. We looked at um, global variables, global immutable variables as a special case kind of a mixture between compile time and runtime. And we looked at parameter lists, uh, which are potentially lengthy parameter lists, and also mixtures of different um, of those two, two techniques. So even though runtime configuration, reconfiguration is actually possible with runtime variability in principle, we need to be very careful with this because this typically needs uh, the developer to think of 
the complete state of the program and transfer it to another state, to migrate it to another state that corresponds to the other uh, configuration, the new configuration. What we see with one-time variability is that variability is spread all over the program. Uh, it's hard to identify those parts and except for the case of immutable global variables, uh, we will always deliver all the variable parts. And at the same time, we have the problem with immutable global variables that we cannot configure this from the outside, right? So if you remember all this technique from the first part, they are not uh, represented with immutable global variables. We have some further reading for you, and this is actually pretty good represented in those two uh, books as a topic, uh, runtime variability with different techniques and their advantages and disadvantages. And we have sort of a um, practice that could help you to um, get into more deta uh, details with the topic and reflect the topic. And this is why are code scattering, code tightening, and code replication problematic? So why do you think this could be a problem in practice? And what is the problem of delivering all the variable parts uh, with one term variability? Why is it a problem if we deliver all the variability uh, to our customers and end users? We will actually come back to this uh, last question then in the third lecture and have fun with the practice.